ఒకటి సో ఐ విల్ నాట్ గివ్ very much details of uh, review of literature but i will talk about more of basic because for this talk is for uh, post graduate students so i will talk about what are the evolutions of interscopes what are the types of interscope what are the different techniques we do for different type of interscope and i will not talk about the interscope related ercp and when it is being done in altered anatomy so if you will see the small bowel it is black box of gi tract the reason it length is 6 to 8 meters so it is difficult to negotiate and it has a looked anatomy within the abdominal cavity and apart from that the one end of the small intestine is attached with the mesentery even though the in peritoneum it floats but in the not in every direction the reason being it is fixed with the mesentery so the small bowel interoscopy is very labor intensive endoscopic procedures mm -hmm. and another challenge is that when the patient has abdominal surgery or altered anatomy it is very difficult to perform the small bowel interoscopy so if you will see how the small bowel interoscopy has evolved over the time so in 17 and 80s there are sondes and ropeway type of endoscopy that was very cumbersome difficult to do and usually it takes 6 to 8 hours to perform the procedures then come the pus interoscopy with video scope which made our life more easier to perform however the drawback of pus interoscope is that you will not perform whole bowel interoscopy total interoscopy is not possible with this in 2001 the major breakthrough come in the form of video capsule endoscopy so you can examine whole of the bowel then come double balloon interoscopy single balloon interoscopy and then a spiral interoscopy the benefit of video capsule endoscopy is that it is non invasive however you cannot perform the therapeutic procedure but benefit of all the interoscopy is that you can do the detailed observation of the lesion you can take sam you can do sampling you can do therapeutic procedures however it is invasive and sometimes fraught with complications so if you will see the indications the common indications for interoscopy are a small bowel bleeding a small bowel polyposis or tumor or inflammatory bowel disease when you you require either for in, uh, for diagnosis or for therapeutic purposes sometimes in chronic diarrhea due to malabsorption or protein losing in enteropathy you require small bowel interoscopy and various therapeutic procedure you can perform with a small and bowel interoscopy so coming to the contraindications after knowing the indications the various contraindications are as we do in other endoscopy either upper gi or colonoscopy like if a patient is not suitable for general anesthesia because these procedures usually require either deep sedation or general anesthesia so it is mandatory the patient should be fit for this if there is patient has uncontrolled coagulopathy patient has perforation or pregnancy the other contraindications in anti grade approach or trans oral trans oral approach if the patient has varices strictures deep mucosal laceration or submucosal fibrosis you can't perform the interoscope examination and a retrograde approach if a patient has severe inflammation active inflammation of the colon you should not perform the Uh, interoscopic examination apart from if the patient has a stricture so coming to the type of interoscope we call it usually the device assisted interoscopy reason being we use apart from endoscopy we use some device to help go deep inside the small bowel so one is balloon assisted inter inter interoscopy and it is three types double balloon interoscopy single balloon interoscopy and another one is navier we will talk about it later and second is a spiral interoscopy in 2008 the first one is spiral interoscopy is manually later on the newer version comes with motorized so it becomes our life easier the balloon assisted interoscopy is due to the push and pull maneuver because you push then you pull however a spiral interoscope has another technique because it uses the rotational motion to go deep inside the small bowel 
so if you will see these are the different types of uh, interoscope but what is uh, important is you can see the length of interoscope is at least 2 cent 2 meters so it is very long and also the working channel of these all interoscope are small it is 2.8 mm so we will know later it is difficult in a small working channel performing the therapeutic procedures then the other important part of all the interoscopes are over tubes the reason being the over tube helps in the bowel reduction the bowel pleating and straightening of the next segment so that you can have a deep forward intubation so these are the various type of over tubes uh, spiral single balloon and double balloon interoscopes what also you should note that the length of all the uh, over tubes they are also not very smaller one the length of all the tubes you can see it is more than 1 meter so the length of interoscope and also the length of uh, over tube is very long so that's hinder sometimes doing the deep interoscoping so the first come the double balloon interoscope it has both at the tip of the endoscope and also at the tip of the over tube there is a latex balloon so you cannot perform if the patient has latex allergy you cannot do with single double balloon endoscope and also it has a balloon pump system that helps in uh, inflating and deflating the balloon both over tube and endoscope with the help of this we go deep inside the double balloon uh, during double balloon interoscopy so how do we perform the double balloon interoscopy so you go deep inside beyond the uh, d2 or d3 you advance the endoscope first after, before inflating the after inflating the over tube so that you go in, you can go in deep inside it and after that you inflate the tip of the endoscope balloon and deflate the over tube balloon and after that you advance the over tube till the tip of the inflated endoscope balloon and then inflate the over tube balloon and after both inflating both endoscope tip and also the over tip balloon you withdraw the balloon so that there is a pleating of the small bowel intestine and this movement is repeated again and again so that you go deep inside the small bowel the second one is single balloon interoscope single balloon reason being there is a single balloon at the tip of our tube there is no balloon at the tip of the endoscope so it is single balloon and also it is made up of a silicon so you can use in latex energy uh, latex allergy patients and there is a hydrophilic coating inside the over tube so that there is a less frictions between the endoscope and also with the with the over tube so that you have easy movement during uh, procedure and there is a at the tip of a uh, over tube there is a radio opaque material so that you can see the where you have or how much you have advanced during the uh, interoscopic examination with the help of fluoroscopy and this also comes with the balloon control unit with the help of that you can inflate and deflate the balloon and also if it maximum pressure is reached you can deflate itself also the benefit of single balloon is that there is a shorter setup time and there is a because of only one balloon is there it is less problematic during balloon control however the problem is that because there is no balloon at the tip you have a difficulty in withdrawing the scope when you pleat the small bowel so what you have to do the movements are same except the tip of endoscope should be angulated so that you can hold the intestine at that place and then you can maneuver it so that's the only demerit of uh, this single balloon interoscope however the merit is that it is easier to set up and do the movement the another one is navy ed uh, on we call it also the on demand interoscope developed in israel uh, it is through the scope balloon you can go through the if the channel is 3.7 mm or 3.8 mm you can pass uh, through this and you can inflate the balloon and with the help of this you can advance the endoscope and also it has a balloon inflation system with the help of that you can inflate and deflate the balloon so advantage of this navy it is that suppose that you are doing colonoscopy you are not advancing so you can put this and with the help of that 
as an anchoring device, you can complete your colonoscopy or you can go deep inside the either through the retrograde or anti anti-grade methods. And also, uh, after removing this balloon, you can take the endoscopic biopsy and therapeutic capabilities, and it is very easy to operate. So this is the Navy Aid on-demand endoscope. But however, there is a less experience with this world over. So there are difficulty in balloon-assisted endoscopy is that it is technically challenges because it takes a long procedure duration. It is cumbersome to set up, and also you require a skilled assistance to handle the endoscope, the endoscopist itself, and also to handle the overtube. The other problem with that is that overtube scope frictions. So between the scope and overtube, there is a friction. So you will have a difficulty in advancing the scope. And also because of a smaller channel diameter, working channel. So, and you can see in this fluoroscopic image, there is looping around. So it is difficult to pass the accessories sometimes uh, either sampling or doing therapeutic procedures. There's the other, another disadvantage of balloon assisted interoscope. So a spiral interoscopy to avoid all these problems. So you have seen the simple screw. It has a helical inclined plane. And what does this screw do? Uh, does that it converts the rotational motion into the linear motion. Same happens in a spiral interoscopy. So it converts the rotational motion into the linear motion and the small bowel pleats over it. So initial version of that is a spiral enteroscope is manually rotable over tube with helical design. And it is very long around 118 uh, centimeters. So the total enteroscopy rate is very low in this uh, spiral enteroscopy initial version of this. And there is a lower risk of acute pancreatitis as compared to the double balloon and single balloon interoscopy. So then comes the newer version that is novel motorized spiral interoscopy. It has a scope, it has a smaller over tube with helical design over it. And you can couple with the uh, interoscope and there is a electric motor attached to it that rotates the over tube. So it becomes easier because it does not require manual force. There is a foot pedal and what does it, if you will put the forward panel, it will have a clockwise rotation and there will be pleating of the uh, small bowel. And if you will put, uh, push the backward pedal, there will be a positive effect, anti-clockwise motion and there is an pleating of the small bowel. And also it has a power spiral control unit that gives you the idea of how much force or how much friction is being applied. So if there is a maximum fric uh, friction, like here you can see in the LED light, if there is a maximum friction, it will not advance. So coming to the uh, interoscope, proper novel uh, spiral interoscopy, the length is as we have in colonoscopy, 160 centimeter. The 16 centimeter length is at the tip of the endoscope and beyond that 24 centimeter is length of the over tube. And the working channel is larger as compared to the double balloon and single balloon interoscope. It is 3.2 mm channel. And the, with the fin, it has a diameter of 13.1 mm and it is made up of silicon and it is pliable. So it does not cause too much trauma. And the how we perform that, you dilate the upper esophageal sphincter with SG dilator, 16, 18, and 20 uh, gauze at uh, 20, and followed by in graded manners, followed by lub lubricate it and put the over tube over it. And there is two lock system and you lock it so that it does not come out of the endoscope during rotatory motion. And then it is ready for uh, uh, going inside the, through the transoral or trans anal route. Always remember, you have to, you can't do push and pull maneuver as you do in a small bowel and uh, single balloon or double balloon interoscope. You have to go with the movement of a spiral movement. You can't, like in a, uh, upper GI or colonoscopy, we can push and pull method, you can't do that. You have to go inside or you have to come out with the movement of a spiral with pleating and unpleating. 
for endoscope setup setup is very important the reason being it is difficult to perform and it takes long time so you should have a dedicated team you should have anesthesia team and anesthesia machine you should have a water jet function so that it helps you in going deep inside without without the help of air or co2 and also you require a co2 encephalation device and various accessories that are required for performing the therapeutic procedures in play encephalation of co2 is very important the reason being if there is excessive amount of air in the uh, in the bowel it will prevent the shortening procedure also it will cause discomfort to the patient and also intra procedural complications and it is difficult to insert endoscope deeper so co2 is very rapidly absorbed and exhaled through the breath so encephalation of co2 will help you in a deeper intubation increases the rate of total endoscopy rate and minimizes post endoscopy discomfort so it's very important to have you and also fluoroscopy is required during learning curve it is usually required many times uh, you want to know where we have reached however when you master the technique you require only few fluoroscopy reason being when you face difficulty going deep inside then you require fluoroscopy and sometimes you require to visualize length of structures and fistula you require fluoroscopic image like in this fluoroscopic image you can see we are not going beyond the ic junction so we did fluoroscopy to find out where we have a stuck some do's and don't of endoscopy you should have very strong indication don't perform in every patients so it's very important second thing you should have experience of capsule reading the reason being it helps you in lesion interpretation and also helps you approach the lesion usually if the lesion in uh, upper two third of then you will approach with the transoral route if it is in lower one third of a small bowel then you can approach with the retrograde approach and also this procedure should not performed in a hurry you should have enough time at least one to two hours so that you should have a peace of mind and you should perform the procedure because sometimes it's very frustrating and it takes a lot of time to negotiate into the small bowel you should also require a proper training you should attend hand on courses you should observe live courses and at least 5 to 10 cases should be done under the supervision so that you should have adequate experience before delving in deep into the small bowel there are two approaches either trans oral or trans anal we also call anti grade or retrograde approach it depends upon the patient symptoms and imaging findings as i talked earlier that if there is initial two third of a small bowel you go with the anti grade approach and if it is lower one third of a small bowel you go with the retrograde approach for trans oral you require only overnight fasting but at our center we usually give one peg leg stretch it also so that we should have a uh, lower one third of a small bowel should be completely clean for trans anal approach you should require colonoscopic bowel preparation coming to the anesthesia the trans oral route require a deep sedation or we usually do the nasal intubation and for trans anal route you require a conscious sedation so you should have a anesthetist team with you during performing an endoscopic examination particularly for trans anal approach sometimes it is very difficult to go deep inside reason being there is a long looped colon there is a large diameter of a cecum and difficult to negotiate the ileocecal valve so what you you have to do use water instead of air so that the colon does not get inflated and the, you shorten the scope also so that your scope should be straightened and also the over tube inflation should not be in the distal ascending colon it should be near at the proximal ascending colon like in this right side of image so that you can easily go inside the ileocecal junction however sometimes it is very frustrating to go inside the ileocecal uh, junction cross the ileocecal junction and second thing you should not do immediate uh, reduction after going into the ileum otherwise you will again fall back into the cecum you go deep inside and then do the reduction these are various endoscopic image this is the uh, proximal jejunum you can see there is uh, circular folds then this is entry into the ileocecal junction with the retrograde approach uh, takes many times to go inside the ileocecal junctions and this is the retrograde approach you can see the difference in the left side of image and the lower image the jejunal fold is absent in the ileum and also the 
uh, bilayer sorter in the terminal ileum some tips and tricks use minimal air or co2 so you do suction 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 it's very important otherwise you will not able to go inside like in a spiral interoscopy what we do beyond dj flexor we uh, we stop using the co2 with the help of water we go inside and also very important that you do mucosal inspection both when you are going inside or also coming out uh, outside during withdrawal withdrawal also the reason being there are, if there is a mucosal abrasion it mimics vascular and inflammatory lesion so you will not be able to sure whether it is traumatic lesion or it is actual lesion and also in double balloon and single balloon lubricate accessories before advancement into the endoscope channel the reason being it is looped and a smaller channel working channel like in this case you can see this is the lesion but we have when we are going inside uh, we did not find this lesion so we know this is because of a trauma so it's very important you should when you reach the maximum depth or you find a lesion please leave a tattoo mark or you can do the clipping the reason being if a patient requires surgery or interventional radiology uh, for doing like a dsa embolization it's very important to localize the lesion so if you will leave the mark or clip it will help us either surgeons or the interventional radiologists to perform the perform uh, easily however during tattoo mark first you inject the saline then put the tattoo mark the reason being otherwise it will uh, spill in the peritoneal cavity and cause problem what we have to do when we are stuck we are not advancing reason being either it is sharp angulation or there is a repeated slippage and there is no forward advancement there are various methods of doing it you put the gentle abdominal pressure you change the patient position you do the loop reduction and decompression and use water as an insufflation even after all these methods it is sometimes that you are not able to go inside however there are combinations of all these methods will help you go inside the deep into the small bowel however if there is a repeated slippage and you are not able to go inside it means either there is a fixed bowel and there is a maximum pleating so abdominal compression if you are going with the retrograde you do on the right side of the abdomen and if you are going anti grade approach because the jejunum and ileum usually in the left side of the, of the abdomen abdominal cavity so you uh, give the gentle compression on the left side of the abdomen like in you can see here we are giving the gentle compression and you can see the endoscopic uh, view in which the compression is being given so coming to the various comparison of enteroscopy total enteroscopy rate is i think similar in double balloon enteroscopy and newer version of a spiral enteroscopy however it is less in single balloon enteroscope and as uh, older version of a spiral enteroscopy time taken for procedure it is less in a spiral endoscope uh, enteroscopy and however it is longer it is 1 to 2 hours in double balloon and single balloon enteroscope the risk of pancreatitis is minimal in a spiral endoscopy as compared to the single and a double balloon endoscope various adverse events but if you feel, you can see that almost 10000 of patient procedures has been performed in patients and the major complication rate is less than 1% and also the complication rate increases when you are performing the therapeutic procedure so it's very important when you are performing therapeutic procedure be more careful reason being that the small bowel is very thin so you should perform procedure very carefully and you also have a good training and to prevent the acute pancreatitis you should initiate the balloon when you cross either dj flexor or you cross the d2 or d3 so that there is a less chances of acute pancreatitis uh, like in this case when we are performing a spiral enteroscopy we can see there is a mucosal uh, abrasion because of helical surface and also because of dilatation various therapeutics you can perform you can take uh, multiple biopsy you can perform the polypectomy you can inject it elevate it and then cut it if there is a bleeding you can clip it also however customize your thermal settings for a small bowel reason being the thinness otherwise there will be a risk of perforation or deep thermal injury 
You can do dilatation of fibrotic structure when it is short, straight, and non ulcerated. However, mind it if there is abscess ulcer in fistula, do not perform the dilatation in these conditions. Coming to the study, uh, AIG Hyderabad has just published the 61 cases of novel motor, uh, motorized spiral enteroscopy, and the total enteroscopy rate is very high, uh, very high, uh, 61%, almost as compared to the double balloon enteroscopy. And also, the total procedure time is very less 35 to 40 minutes, and there is no major adverse event. And they can have a diagnostic yield 65 to 70%, and they can perform the therapeutic intervention in 24% of the patients. So, conclusion my talk that enteroscopy is a major advancement in a small bowel evaluation, as both for diagnostic and therapeutic. But there are challenges. You require good training and good setup to do it. And also, with the coming of novel motorized spiral enteroscopy, it takes less time. And person, with personal, personal experience, it is easy to do it. However, yeah. we require further studies to uh, give us more results. And in all the studies, the, uh, they have not performed in surgical patients, so we require more data. And lastly, you should have a personality trait of a patient. If you will not have a patient, please do not do perform enteroscopy in, because sometimes it is very frustrating and mm -hmm. you will not achieve good results. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Deepak, for your fantastic talk on introscopy. I think this was a great overview for all beginners and also for, uh, for seasoned gastroenterologists. Uh, you highlight very, very important points. How do you practice uh, the small introscopy? And you also told about uh, the tricks and trade of uh, uh, introscopy. And you put a lot of time on uh, mechanized endoscopes which I would say is a boon for small bubble introscopy because it's much easier to do. Certainly this is expensive at one time investment, but uh, this is much easier to do and your success rate is much higher. Uh, you made a very important point, uh, which, uh, which I think all of us believe very strongly about that uh, being a good endoscopist is all about perseverance. It's not, it's not there that every time we are going to succeed, but we have a, our personality traits that uh, we perceive here, that uh, there is a, a patient, you are doing a procedure and you are taking more time. It's one starts sweating because it's a workload, but that's not what all about. about all about that, how do you persevere to make the success? At the same time, realizing that we are not making unduly long and complicating the procedure. This also is a very important point to, to think about that, uh, our procedures are remains very very safe. With this, uh, with this, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Deepak, for a wonderful talk. Uh, we have a couple of questions, but let's let, the first question: uh, While doing endoscopy, be it mechanized endoscopy or be it uh, motorized endoscopy or by double balloon or single balloon, the question comes always that how deep you went inside. And how do you measure, how do you measure, estimate? And this is a question from Dr. Pius. Uh, I know from which city he is, but Pius has asked this question. Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, the distance measured during the small bowel enteroscopy is not very accurate. It is uh, always a, a estimated distance because there is a pleating of a small bowel. So there are various methods to do it, but none of the methods is foolproof method. One of the method, method is doing the push and pull technique, you determine how much in every cycle, how much deep inside you are going and you are noting it down. And at the end of enteroscopic examination, you add these distances and you know how much you have gone inside. Other way of doing it is during the withdrawal, you know how much deep inside you are and then during withdrawal, you know how much you have come out of it. So that will give the estimated distance, particularly in a spiral enteroscope. The third method is uh, given by authors that they, during withdrawal, they have calculated how many circular folds are there. So you calculate the circular folds and multiply it by 0.9. 
so that will give you the estimated depth of insertion however all these methods are fraught with fallacies like in withdrawal when you are quanting there is sudden withdrawal so you will not able to quant how many uh, we have missed it other way of doing it by the fluoroscopy when you are doing fluoroscopy if you find that your scope in the left upper quadrant it means you are in proximal jejunum if it is in lower uh, left lower quadrant it means you have gone into the proximal ileum if you are into the pelvis on fluoroscopic examination it means you have reached the mid ileum and if you are right side it means you have probably reached the terminal ileum but all these methods are only not a full proof method these are only you can measure just estimate uh, just estimation I think this is a fantastic. Uh, certainly, because there's no major, like in upper GI or lower GI, uh, you know how much, even lower GI is very difficult because lo they're looping in lower GI. So your scope may go on 100 centimeters, but you still may be in the sigma or descending colon. So one need to uh, be aware about that. Upper GI is less tricky. That is a more or less uh, straightforward. And you know, can know the distance uh, you went inside the upper GI track. But uh, it's more interesting. These are the basic guidelines. We have, uh, but you want to make a comment on this? I, I agree with uh, Deepak that it is tricky and it's very approximate. What some people do is that you withdraw 20 centimeters at a time. You put your balloon and withdraw 20 centimeters time. And then you say, how many times have you inserted? How many times have you withdrawn? That gives you an idea of what the depth that you've gone or when you're coming back. But then I agree, it's absolutely um, sort of, uh, uh, approximation and nothing definite. And there's again similar questions there that uh, once you use a floor, I mean, single balloon, double balloon or motorized endoscope, uh, would you do always under fluoro? Yeah, usually we perform under fluoro, reason being, uh, there are various reasons because when you are stuck, you don't know how to go about it, then fluoro helps. And also sometimes you want to know the length of the strictures uh, is there any multiple structures? So, and also how much distance you have gone inside. So it definitely helps uh, uh, fluoroscopy when you are performing interoscope examination. Because certainly it helps. It helps to know where you are. Uh, you are stuck. You are unduly not making too many loops, uh, especially for single and double balloon. Is very important. There's there's another question that uh, Dr. Deepak. What are the usual common indications? Uh, you find for uh, or good indications for endoscopy in your practice? So as uh, we talked earlier, that obscure GI bleed, this is the most common indication for doing the endoscopic examination. And also this is the, I think this is the most difficult uh, endoscopic examination. Reason being, sometimes we know that we will not find anything on the endoscopic examination. So you, you perform interoscopic examination, but uh, sometimes you don't find anything. So this is the most common indication of performing interoscopic examination. And this is the indications in which you require full length of a small bowel interoscope, both anti-grade and retrograde approach you require it. The other indications are sampling when you require, uh, like in Crohn's disease or tuberculosis, you are not sure of a diagnosis, you require sampling, then you can do, and then, therapeutic procedures, either in a small bowel bleeding or polypectomy, particularly in Pugh Jagger syndrome, when there is hundreds of polyps. Uh, these are the common indications of doing endoscopic examinations. And the other indications are ERCP, what, uh, which I have not talked because of lack of time. But you. Uh, I think uh, we need to be clear about indications. And in our unit, we've been doing uh, single balloon endoscopy for close to about uh, 13, 14 years now. And we, we always uh, like to get a cross-sectional imaging, either with a bowel ultrasound or preferably a CT or a CT endography. Localize where the lesion is and then go and you know sample because our indication is largely either to take biopsies in the appropriate area or to study the mucosa, like you said, for Crohn's or some kind of obscure ulcers or to do a polypectomy if you know, you're dealing with a pojagar or one of those uh, kind of situations. But uh, this obscure GI bleed is something that I don't really go ahead and do endoscopies. I would rather use a capsule endoscopy, 
to do that. So my cross-sectional imaging would tell me that there are no major strictures. If there is a stricture, then I would uh, do an endoscopy. If there are no strictures, I would depend on a capsule endoscopy to sort of guide me and then decide whether I need to do one or not. Definitely. The one very smart question, like once you do ERCP, you always do methods to prevent post ERC pancreatitis. And it is very clear that uh, true. So there's a question that are there any prophylactic ways to prevent uh, post endoscopy pancreatitis? So I don't think any studies that has looked into it, but uh, reason of pancreatitis in double balloon and single balloon endoscopies, it is postulated that uh, it is mechanical trauma, either to the ampulla or to the uh, pancreas per se. But I'm not aware of any studies that uh, how to prevent the post ERCV pancreatitis, except that uh, you inflate the both over tube or endoscope balloon. When you cross at least D2, at least you, you are sure that you have crossed the ampulla or preferably if you have crossed the DJ flexor, that will lesser, uh, less the chance of having post ERCP, uh, sorry, post endoscopic pancreatitis. Now, I think what we do is, you're absolutely right, uh, Deepak, is that we don't use, we, while we advance the overtube, we never put the balloon till I have at least gone three or four times that I've gone past the donor. So that I'm very clear that I'm nowhere close to the papilla when I inflate the balloon. So at least three or four uh, passages go without using the overtube. And only after that do we sort of inflate the balloon and then stabilize the endoscope with a you know, balloon assisted device. I think and it's a very important learning point. That also, sir, it is very rare event. So I don't think it's very difficult to study these events. It's the rate of uh, pancreatitis is very low, less than 1%. Although hyperapalacemia has been reported to be very high, but the rate of pancreatitis is rare. Absolutely. I think this is a very important point to go to Deepak and Dr. has emphasized that don't inflate balloon uh, balloon because that can uh, in the duodenum. And that's one very important point we should uh, uh, I mean, learn from this uh, uh, discussion. Uh, this other question, uh, Dr. Deepak, that uh, what difference do you find if you inflate uh, your in small intestine by using CO2 or uh, filling it with water? What do you prefer and what is uh, easier to do? So it is always easier with water. You can do it. But CO2 is also a very good option as compared to the air. Reason being, it is very rapidly absorbed through the uh, small bowel and released through the uh, lungs during the breathing. So reason being why we should not do the uh, inflate with the air that it does not get absorbed. It will inflate the small intestine and it will cause discomfort to the patient, push up the diaphragm so that the anesthesia team will become very alarming that your stomach is being distended. And also when the small bowel is inflated, you will not go deep inside it. So that's very difficult because it will not pleat it. So CO2 helps that because it rapidly gets absorbed. And what we do in uh, spiral enteroscopy, when we cross the DJ flexor, we just stop using the CO2. We uh, go inside with the help of water so that it makes our life easier. Yeah, but the problem is that the spirus has, you can use your um, irrigation pump or the water jet, but with the small yeah. balloon or double balloon, you don't have that. So yeah. quite often you use CO2 yeah. and at times use, and of course it helps in lubrication as well of the, you know, mucosa becomes a little moist and the scope goes in much easier. So our choice is water if we can help it, otherwise CO2, but uh, never air. So one other important technique in colonoscopy, Deepak, you know, that if we, there's, a, there's a device which tells you, or magnetic device tells you that where the scope is, is it looping in, right? You put the device over the, the new, new version of uh, 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 interest, uh, colonoscopes. So do you aware of, uh, are you aware of uh, such device uh, uh, in introscope? It's not it's easy to think that it's easy to make, but are you aware that- uh, It's not available in a spiral enteroscopy per se. But one can always add that facility to spiral. Add that, but issue is that there is so much looping in a small bowel, you will never be sure where are you. 
absolutely that's the problem with the small bowel endoscopy i think with that uh, we like to thank you dr deepak for a wonderful talk on endoscopy the basics and the clinical indications differences between different endoscopes uh, and some tricks you advised and we had wonderful discussion on some very important points uh, thank you dr deepak uh, now moving on to one another topic that's a polypectomy i think uh, all of us uh, will have to do polypectomy at some point of uh, time in our industry should almost uh, every day or not if not every day then probably uh, at once or twice per week so uh, for that uh, we have a uh, wonderful speaker dr nareesh bhat uh, dr nareesh bhat uh, is uh, a senior gastroenterologist at the aster cmi in bangalore and i think is a great teacher and we have learned a lot of things from him the way he explains things the sim- the way simply uh, the simplistic way he try to explain things and the try to explain the methods and dr bhat uh, is uh, also one of the course directors of a mini workshop on nbi and he's a teacher i think one of the first teachers in in chromo endoscopy is an nbi so dr bhat thank you uh, thank you govind and uh, thank you usha and your team for uh, having me here this evening today i'm going to speak to you all about uh, some aspects of polypectomy and as uh, dr govind said polypectomy is something that you have to master because all of us would be needed to do that uh, on a almost daily basis so when you evaluate a polyp obviously you want to know what's the site the size of the polyp the morphology using the paris classification and even um, sort of think about what may be the possible diagnosis using either the kudo jnet or nice classifications once you have this information then you decide whether you're going to really attack the polyp and do a polypectomy or you go to abort and say no i'm not going to do it this is perhaps malignancy or this is something that i can't do and sort of about the procedure so the important things as i said is the size whether the size is small a diminutive polyp less than 5 mm or is less than 10 mm or 10 to 20 or more that's important we'll see why that's important the morphology that's a paris um, classification or whether it's pedunculated subpedunculated or a flat polyp again is extremely important the possible histology also needs to be factored in whether it's hyperplastic whether it's a serrated lesion whether it's adenomatous or even a hematomatous polyp and of course the site whether it's a rectum right colon or transverse colon etc all these are factors which um, sort of are important in taking a decision what you're going to do so the first question is how often do you biopsy polyps and i see that this is the most common mistake done across the country is that people see polyps and they just go and biopsy and come out i don't seem to understand the reason at all one is that there can be a sampling error as you said you you can see the forceps is picking out some bit of polyp here while there's a malignant focus somewhere else you make a wrong diagnosis and in the process if it's a flattish polyp you may end up causing subuvical fibrosis which can complicate your procedure subsequent so the first rule is never biopsy a polyp unless you think it's malignancy and you're not going to do anything further if it's a malignant lesion yes biopsy the malignancy can come out but if it's not never biopsy a polyp and i think every person who's doing a colonoscopy should be armed with his accessories and technicians available to be able to perform a polypectomy to the best of his ability so in the present era we do an optical biopsy and dissection is the golden rule so there are i have listed out certain conditions which are contraindications or situations where you would be cautious in doing a polypectomy obviously a subepithelial lesion or an inverted diverticulum you don't want to be uh, caught doing that uh, if there are features of deep submucosal invasion i think uh, it's better to just take a biopsy and come out 
if you plan to do a lift and it does not lift to a submucosal lift, it doesn't happen, uh, you'll have to be a little cautious about what you're going to do. If it has a thick, short stalk, or very important in our setting is you lack the expertise, experience, and the accessories to deal with the situation appropriately. Of course, we need to be concerned about the consequences of a polypectomy, like bleeding, which is, can be immediate or delayed. There can be perforation. There can be a post-polypectomy syndrome where there is injury to the muscularis propria. So it's not quite a perforation, but all the features of perforation like guarding, uh, fever, leukocytosis, and so on. And of course, uh, that if you have not achieved a R0 resection, that you have not been able to get the polyp out completely, that's again an issue that you'll have to deal with. Now coming to the technique of polypectomy, I am not going to go into characterization of polyps. I think we've had a lot of talks on this uh, in other sessions. I'll go only onto the techniques of polypectomy today. You have various uh, options using biopsy forceps. You can do use a snare. You can do what is called an endoscopy mucosal resection which can be on block or it can be piecemeal, or you can do the ultimate, which is the endoscopic submucosal dissection. Now, if you talk about the cold techniques, one of the first things is a simple cold biopsy. Now you see these pictures, you small, these small polyps that you have here, it's not too large. And if you look at the open forceps, this is, just about two or three millimeters in size. And if you look at this nice study, it showed us that if you use a jumbo biopsy forceps, you can get an almost 100% resection with a single bite of a polyp that is anywhere from one to almost three mm. Anything more than that, you would not be removing completely. And therefore, you can use a cold biopsy with a jumbo forceps for a very small diminutive polyp. And why is this safe? The reason is that we know that any high-grade dysplasia occurs in larger lesions. So less than 5 mm, the risk is very, very small. And hence, you can just get away with removing it with a biopsy forceps. Now, if you look at a cold snare polypectomy, which is the other technique, and uh, I think a lot of us need to understand this very clearly because this is what now uh, is going to be the future of a lot of polypectomies is cold snare polypectomy. And now it is said that the cold revolution has now descended on us. So here you have a small polyp, you interrogate it and you open the polyp, get the polyp around five, six o'clock position, open the snare over it, depress it and hold it and then give it a little bit of the margin and then resect. So this is a cold snare polypectomy, no cautery used at all. So if you have a sessile lesion or a flattish or small lesion, which is less than 10 mm, which may be diminutive or even a little more than that up to six to 10 mm, a cold snare polypectomy is far superior to a hot snare technique because there are lower rates of delayed bleeding, only 1% compared to 9% with hot snare. No post polypectomy syndrome, this is 20% with a hot snare or hot biopsy, shorter duration of procedure and equal polyp retrieval rates. So this is something that we all need to understand and master is how to do a cold snare polypectomy. Just again to reinforce, get the lesion at six o'clock, suck out the air so that you've depressed it and open the snare on top of it. Again, depress the snare so that it's on the wall. And then as you tighten the snare with a bit of the margin, further decompress by suction and you'll find that the entire polyp is within the um, polypectomy snare and you ask your technician or whoever it is to just cut it off. And this is what you find. There's hardly any bleeding and it is extremely safe. So safe that you can use it on patients even who are on antiplatelet drugs without any problem. 
If there's a little bleeding, all you have to do is irrigate water with a water jet and most of the time it stops. So to summarize here, small sessile polyps, which are often hyperplastic, SSA or low-grade dysplasia, very small cold biopsy forceps, polyps four to nine millimeters, you can do a cold stair polypectomy. Now the hot techniques were very hot for many, many decades. But now we realize they are far too hot to handle. We have the hot biopsy forceps, the hot snare polypectomy, and the hot snare EMR. Why uh, are we sort of, why did we prefer to use a hot technique? Because we are worried about the bleed. If you use a hot technique, obviously you delay, you decrease the risk of bleeding. If you use a pure cutting current, when you use that, there's an immediate bleed. So you, people uh, said you must use a coagulation current and that unfortunately led to more delayed bleed. So you sort of have to now uh, have a kind of arrangement that you don't have immediate bleed or you don't have a delayed bleed. And so you have to have good quality cauteries which will give you, a, you know, the appropriate kind of blended current that we need, and I'll talk to bit to you about it. So remember that hot techniques can lead to perforations and a post polypectomy syndrome, and this is very very important to understand. Using the hot forces for removing small lesions used to be popular in the 80s and early 90s, and there's an excellent study that showed that the thermal injury was very, very prominent. You had a thermal injury going right up to the muscularis propria in a lot of patients. There's incomplete resection in up to 20% of patients and there were artifacts in specimen, so the pathologists would not be happy. And therefore, hot biopsy forceps are now not recommended for use. Look at these patients, 34, 4% had a partial muscularis propria necrosis, full thickness necrosis of muscularis propria, 22%. So, serocytis histologically, 32%. So, you have a lot of problems of deep thermal injury, and therefore, hot biopsy forces should never be used henceforth. What do you do with a juicy looking polyp like this? I'm sure all of us would love to see polyps. Uh, like this because they are easily amenable for therapy. And for this, we use um, good energy uh, devices. So we typically, if we, with the, the Herbe, we use what is called the endocut Q. Q is for polyp, and it has both a, a cutting current and then a coagulation which alternates. So there's an ins incisional incision, then it cuts, then it coagulates. So not only does it resect the polyp, it also coagulates the vessels. So what is important to know is that you must hold the snare properly and lift up the polyp. Don't involve the valve when you're starting the resection. And the third thing is that when you uh, lift up the polyp, what also happens is that once you put the current, the stalk shrinks. So which means that if your snare is not quite high up, you can get into problem. Just look at this patient. Nice juicy polyp. Where are the mistakes that we've done? We put the snare. We have not really clearly looked as to where the, the stock is not very large, but it looked a little big. So he said, no, I'd rather coagulate it enough. You tried that and see what happens. It's not only really, this whole thing has become white. The wall has also become thick. And this patient had a post polypectomy syndrome. So therefore, remember, whether it's a hot snare polypectomy or a hot biopsy forceps, any use close to the wall can lead to problems. Look at this. When you use it on a sessile or a subpedunculated lesion, look at the injury here coming up to the muscularis propria. So protection of the deep submucosa and muscularis propria becomes very important when you use a hot snare polypectomy, especially when you use sessile or subpediculated lesions 
or even lesions with a small stock. If the figures are given here as to how frequently it occurs. So the mantra is avoid routine hot snare polypectomy in sessile lesions or with short stocks. And I'll tell you how you can um, deal with it and prevent this. So what do you do, as I said? Place the snare carefully away from the head, but well away from the colonic wall. Lift the polyp gently up and away from the colonic wall and use an endocut Q mold. This will ensure that if you have a pedunculated polyp, you can use the hot snare polypectomy fairly safe. We are obviously worried about bleeds and we know that the blood supply to the polyps is obviously what decides the bleeding risk. Very interesting study. They looked at the diameter of the polyp base, which may be the base of the stalk or if it's sessile, the entire polyp. And if you find as the size of the base increases, the number of blood vessels increase. More blood vessels, more the risk of uh, bleed. So if you have a sessile lesion like this, look at the number of blood vessels, at least we can see three. If you have a thin stalk, there may be just one blood vessel. And so you may get away with a simple hot snare polypect. So a stalk which is more than 5 mm, be careful because this is, may have more than one blood vessel. That brings us to the point of how to prevent a bleed. Obviously, you've got to be careful about patients who are anti anticoagulants, who are bleeding, clotting disorders, but uh, not often easy to get that history before you get it. Often we get into problem and then we realize what has happened. But we can certainly anticipate a bleed. As I said, a thick stalk or a large polyp always anticipate a bleed and take precautions. And what are the precautions? I've listed them out here. Uh, we can do a cold snare polypectomy. We can cook and cut, that is use a little coagulation current and then cut. You can use a prophylactic loop and cut. You can put a prophylactic clip and cut or just loop and leave it. Of course, every time you do a procedure, you must be prepared for an immediate bleed and you may have to deal with it with the snare tip and coagulate it. You may have to use clips or even chemo spray. Now let's look at what some of these patients we've had to do. I have a large pedunculated polyp with the head size more than two centimeters or a stalk more than one centimeter. You can use an endolip or a clip, uh, plus minus an adrenaline injection. This is how we a large thick stalk, at least three or four vessels here. So we put a loop here. Here we put clips. Uh, this is an interesting video that we just did uh, four or five days ago. Uh, this was a young child with large polyps. And so what did we do? We inject it. Then we got a snare across. And then this was being done by one of my younger colleagues. And what did she do? She did that and then she said, no, I'm too close to the wall. And what does she do? She repositions it. Reposition just below the head. And then the standard technica unit is when then we cook it. Cook it is use coagulation, that is the blue pedal for some time. And once you've done that, then you go ahead and cut it, resect it using the yellow pedal. So once you do this, you find that you have, you're away from the wall, you've made sure your vessels are all taken care of and you've got a complete resection of the polyp. And there you see a very clean, uh, kind of stock, you can see the blue of the indigo carmine that we have injected. So this is the inject cook and cut method. Uh, I've, I've loved that method a lot. Now, what do you do with this kind of huge polyp? And what we did is we said, there's no way I'm going to get something here and cut because it's going to be disastrous. This was a seven or eight year old kid. So this was a projector syndrome, we knew what the histology was. So all we did was we put a loop and left it. And we can use this for a Pojaga syndrome or lipoma. You may not want to use it for a, an adenomatous polyp because you want the histology. So this is what we do is loop and leave strategy. Again, very popular in Pojaga's in the small bowel. 
we now move on from the pedunculated lesions to the sessile lesions, a larger sessile lesions, more than 10, such as these. What do we do? What's the strategy that we use? Important here is to first assess the polyp because we know that a polyp more than 10, the risk of high grade dysplasia is as high as 28%. So, first assess, don't be in a hurry to say, assess characterize the polyp and then say, okay, is it safe for me to think is it just a low-grade dysplasia? Will I be able to get the whole thing out? And then you plan your resection because you don't want deep submucosal invasion and you're cutting through the uh, submucosa at that uh, situation. We spoke about cold snare polypectomy. We spoke about hot snare polypectomy. And now we're going to talk about EMR. Remember that we, when we do a cold snare polypectomy, we are actually going through the mucosa itself. Just a bit of the muscularis mucosa often is seen. So anything above that gets resected, but certainly not the submucosa. When you do a EMR, you actually go through the submucosa. So they are not quite the same. Cold snare polypectomy is not the same as EMR because in EMR, you go through the submucosa. And when you want a complete resection and to avoid deep injury, you want to do an EMR. And what is this EMR? An EMR is as far as possible an oblock resection, complete resection in one piece. A submucosal injection is done to avoid injury to the muscle layer because you're going through the submucosa. You have got to be close to the muscle. So you want enough space between the the muscularis propria and the mucosa. We inject various kinds of things and our uh, usual th choice is saline, indigo, carmine and one in 100,000 adrenaline and we get a more complete resection when we uh, get this little cushion there in the submucosa. So, you know, to show it in a cartoon, what do we do? This is a lesion. We inject into the submucosa Elevated, you can use a gel fusion or you can use saline or starch or mucor, whatever. Then you resect it using a snare and you remove the polyp. So, this is a sort of biggest lesion here. You can see we have injected uh, submucosally and so you can make out the margins well too. Now, this is a not so big lesion, but it is sessile. And so, I would do an EMR. I would not risk a deep burn or post polypectomy syndrome in this patient. So even lesions now which are small but sessile, we prefer to do a EMR. So you lift, you resect, and you look at the polyp for the target sign. I'll talk about it again. The next interesting thing is something called an underwater EMR. What you do is you drown the polyp in saline, the saline floats, the mucosa and submucosa away from the muscularis. So you don't have to actually inject anything. The water in the lumen does that for you. You also get good optical imaging and then you get your snare, put it around and resect. Yes, sometimes if there's a perforation, which is not very often, uh, it's quite rare, you know, that water can go into the peritoneum. Uh, bleed, yes, you may have to suck out and then deal with the bleed uh, thing, but generally, an underwater EMR is where a lot of people are heading these days. What you get from an underwater EMR is a better R0 resection rate. An on-block resection is much better. Actually, you are able to get bigger polyps with an underwater because the moment the polyp floats and you put your snare, the polyp seems to get captured within the snare very easily. So a, a slightly bigger polyp up to two centimeters is perhaps best handled with an underwater EMR technique. So underwater EMR, good, no submucosal injected, just drown it in saline. It's not water, it's saline. EMR adverse events, we spoke about bleed, both immediate and delayed, most often they'll resolve spontaneously. With persistent bleeds, you manage it endoscopically with clips, snare tip or coagulation forceps. Perforation rates are low. And of course, poly post polypectomy syndrome also is low. All this is because we are 
protecting the muscularis mucosa, muscularis propria by keeping it away from the resection march. So summary slide number two, to recapitulate small sessile polyps, one to three mm, whole biopsy, polyps four to nine, whole slayer polypectomy. If you have a pedunculated polyp with a thin stalk, horse layer polypectomy. If you have a thick stalk, prophylactic options like I showed you, inject, clip, loop, cook, whatever, or combinations. If you have slightly bigger, larger sessile pop polyps up to 20 millimeters, you can try an underwater EMR or a regular EMR with a hot snare. If you have larger polyps, more than two centimeters, an on-block resection is not possible because larger the size, the more risk of bleeding and perforation. So here, you cannot attempt an on-block resection. So what do you do? You do what is called a piecemeal EMR. So piecemeal EMR <coughs> is basically EMR in the sense that you have to inject and then you remove it in a peaceful fashion. Is You start at one edge and then repeatedly resect till you've got rid of all of it. Finally, achieve hemostasis. You may need to close it if necessary. Uh, there's an excellent article by Michael Burke's group in uh, gastroenterology, which gives you the technique uh, in a very detailed manner. Now look at this. This is a kind of lateral spreading tumor here, in the right colon, and injected and then resected a cold piece milliamar. No hot snare because it's right colon. Right colon, the wall is thinner, right? And when you have these larger uh, sessile serrated lesions or LSTs or patients are antiplatelets, we prefer to do a cold snare EMR because we do want to avoid the thermal damage. Or you can do a hot snare uh, peaceful EMR like this one of our patients with a large lesion in the rectum was advised um, APR and he came to us and we did a characterization. We're convinced that we have um, low grade dysplasia. So what we did is injected, it started on one end, finished the entire lesion. It was almost a, a four centimeter size lesion. We showed a low grade adenoma. And this is what we found at the end of a year when we followed him up. Another lesion here, large LST, peaceful meal EMR done, large uh, raw surface here and but successfully done, but there is a problem. When you do a piecemeal EMR, there's a high rate of recurrence, as high as 40%. It's more around 14% is what the figure that I would like to quote. And, but the problem is that you have inadequate specimens for the histopathologist. He's not going to find, uh, examine all six or uh, seven pieces that you give him. So he's likely to make mistakes. So these are the limitations. And so what they did, this is again from Michael Bull's group, is they did this, what they call the SCAR study. And they, what they did is, once they, this is a piecemeal EMR, they've removed one large piece here or another piece here. Once they've removed it, all they did is that they, the edges of the margin, they used a snare tip, or you could use the APC and thermally ablate the edge. The re results were remarkable. From an endoscopic recurrence rate of about 20 odd percent, they found it down to four, five, five and a half percent, whether it's histological recurrence or endoscopic. So very simple technique can make your piecemeal EMRs that much more effective. Finally, the ESD, which is an on-block dissection, all the problems of EMR taken care of, and you dissect the deeper submucosal plane, so that even if the superficial submucosa is involved, you can get away with it. And you usually do it for polyps with JNET 2B versus JNET 3. You're not sure. You want to go ahead with the thing, go ahead with an ESD. Don't do a EMR for this. Or your surface pattern irregular, or there are some depressed areas suggesting that there is submucosal invasion, but not in a big way. If it's a non-granular LST, bulky lesion, or you try a submucosal installation, doesn't lift well, you could consider an ESD. Uh, but there are experts 
who are so good that they would not do a piecemeal EMR. They'd go and do uh, ESD in any lesion which they think um, they can tackle. But the more sensible uh, version is that um, if in the rectum, where it's reasonably safe, you can go ahead and do an um, ESD. In the more proximal colon, right colon, be a little less aggressive and do a piecemeal EMR. So this is a procedure, I think all of you know about it. Mark it, instill uh, some solution, make an incision cut, and then dissect in the submucosa, deep submucosa, and get rid of the tumor. So summary three, we've discussed these three findings for the large broad-based polyps, which are in the proximal colon and are low-grade dysplasias. Uh, it's not a bad idea to consider cold EMR piecemeal or an underwater EMR or a piecemeal EMR regular or even an ESD in the hand of experts. In the distal colon and their high-grade dysplasia, maybe ESD is the way to go. Now the last two, three slides. We must recognize deep mucosal injury. This is a target sign. So flip over the polypectomy specimen, see if there's a target sign like this, or there's a target sign in the tissue and deal with it. And excellent study that's come out recently shows that if you have a deep mural injury after endoscopic recession, uh, most of them are easily managed with um, endoscopic clipping. So even if you're aggressive, uh, there's a way out, just clips will bail you out of trouble. But yes, it's important to recognize it at that time. If you have decided to abort an intervention for some reason, you're uh, not able to get it or you have a problem, then you must tattoo for future identification. The general rule is three centimeters distal to the lesion if it's not in the rectum. You, or wherever, if you do it, always in your report document where you have tattooed. The dye is usually a sterile carbon particle in suspension of India ink. And as um, <clears throat> Deepak said, first raise a bleb and then inject the India ink. This is the best way to make sure that it stays there. There are other issues that I have not uh, discussed, maybe we could discuss it later, is how to follow up after polypectomy, uh, how do you resect a recurrence and how do you assess a scar? We will leave it for some other day or maybe the question answer sessions. I'll stop here. Thank you. What a wonderful talk by you, Dr. Bhatt. Remarkable that all the basics of understanding a polyp and the polyp size and how do you take a decision of a uh, way of resecting it. I want a very important point, uh, Dr. Bhatt, you made uh, is that uh, don't biopsy polyp. You biopsy polyp, certainly you get histology, and many of us have that habit of biopsying polyp. But if you do biopsy polyp, you create a, a sub-mucosal fibrosis, and later you can't, resecting that will be very difficult. So, I, I mean, this is the point we must uh, must take uh, take home today, that don't biopsy a polyp. Uh, or if you biopsy, there, there must be a reason for, reason for biopsying it. So it's a thoughtful process rather than a blind process. Actually, uh, today I have a patient who had a transverse colon carcinoma and he obviously had a biopsy of that lesion, but he had six polyps in the left colon. All the six polyps were biopsied. This chap went for surgery. The transverse colon was excised and the polyps left as it is because they were adenomatous and not cancerous. So I think if you're sending for surgery, resect all the polyps before sending the patient for surgery. Or resect the entire colon if you think he's one of those attenuated FAP or one of those uh, uh, kind of syndromes. So the point is that uh, I think there's a, uh, I won't say believe or misbelieve, probably I believe there's a misbelief that uh, we believe that uh, Indians don't have polyps. And therefore, uh, in a many of training institutions, uh, we don't care about the polyps in the colon. That's not the case. Every polyp you see in the colon, you must remove it. If you leave it, there must be a reason for leaving it. Somebody is uh, unwell, somebody is very elderly, somebody is not stable. So there will be indication of not prolonging the procedure. 
But if you see a polyp, dissect it and uh, look at histology. And many of them may be hydromatous polyp. And uh, you prevent, if you remove a polyp, you remove a, you prevent a cancer. So, so with this, I think uh, uh, let's uh, discuss uh, some of the questions, uh, which uh, one of the first questions let me ask, sir, uh, Dr. Bhatt, uh, that uh, you talked about the uh, right colon and left colon difference, and you want to be more careful in the right colon. That's perfect, fine. So th does the same principle apply to other regions of GI tract? For example, uh, Dr. Deepak talked about uh, introscopy, or we find sometimes polyps in the stomach also, or duodenum. So the same principle applies? Absolutely, because the wall in the stomach and the wall in the rectum, they are the two safe places, you know, because the wall is thick as against in the wall in the duodenum or a wall in the esophagus or wall in the right colon. We are much thinner. And so you have to be very cautious, not only about, you know, adjusting your cautery settings so that you avoid a burn, you stick to cold stair methods, make sure you inject and don't get too aggressive if you don't have the skills to deal with the problem. So there's another question that once you plan to do EMR, and you want to inject uh, endocarmine or methylene blue or so. If you do that, what is your depth of injection? You have a needle, you have an EST needle, uh, six millimeter uh, in, uh, needle. So what the depth? And uh, is it, is it, does it matter you go five millimeter, six millimeter or even deeper? No, no, no. It's, it's actually the technique. What we use is we keep the needle out and ask a technician to keep pushing the injectate. And as he's pushing, you plunge your uh, needle in at a particular angle. And then if you have hit the submucosal space, it will suddenly well up, right? If it doesn't well up, then you need to pull back a little until you find the right place. So it is, you know, as a kind of a trial and error that you get it. And with a little experience, you'll find that you're 90, 95% of the time you have entered the submucosa. Once you do that, then you need to push that needle, the axis a little different, so that it now is towards the mucosa, so that the whole thing comes up. I showed you that video where we injected the base, and you saw that thing well up so easily. So it's something that uh, with a little um, uh, experience you will master. So you have to strike the right space, because of the loose areolar tissue, the moment you inject there, it just wells up. And also, it's simple to remember that uh, submucosa is a potential space. It has a little space. Muscle don't have space. So muscle will not swell up, where submucosa will swell up. So there, there's a, you know, this, in Japan, there's a mountain called Mountain Fuji. So uh, Bilal Ahmed want to know that uh, what is Mount Fuji effect uh, in regards to coagulating uh, a poly during polypectomy? Uh, Mount Fuji, Mount Fuji, if you look at the pictures of Mount Fuji, it's there's a mountain there and there's a cap of snow right on top. So if you get that cap on top, remember that you don't know how deep that coagulation effect is down, how much it is affect the rest of the wall. So that is what you have to be sort of thinking. That's what you have to be careful. Uh, I, I, I don't know what exactly is the Mount Fuji effect. I think uh, if you have a stock and you have a Mount Fuji effect there is quite fine. But if it's sessile and you have a Mount Fuji effect, it's like virtually you've used a hot biopsy of forceps and that your depth of injury or the thermal necrosis may be quite deep. But I, I, I stand correct. I am not uh, very sure about the Mount Fuji effect. Maybe I, I could look it up. No, oh, perfect, sir. I think this is a, what is, is, uh, is the thing. Uh, the other point was uh, uh, while injecting, the one question comes at how much do you inject? And suppose there's a polyp, how far you start injecting and to give injection all around, or you just inject one side, two side, three sides, or okay. one side, four sides, and how far you start injecting what for a good lift? See, it's a good question. The question is, how big is a polyp? Now, if you have a polyp that's not so big, say about a one centimeter kind of polyp, you can just go there and inject and that whole polyp will rise. But the problem is if you have a polyp that is on the other side of the fold, you don't want to inject here because then it will flop onto the other side. So you would want to inject approximately so that the polyp flops onto this side. So that's one trick that you must think. 
Second is if you have a more broad-based polyp, you will perhaps require multiple injections. And this is what they call laying the tile technique. You inject in one place, raise it. Okay, can you, did you hand to the camera, sir? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you inject here and you have raised it, don't start injecting here. Inject again very close into that so that, that this whole place lifts up. So you do sequential injections, you know, with a little overlap so that you get the entire polyp up. So that will depend on the size of the polyp. For example, if I have an LST, which is two, three centimeters, I may require two, three injections or more. So there's no finite amount. You lift till the thing that you are comfortable. A beginner would want a huge lift so that he says, I'm nowhere close to the muscle. A more experienced guy would perhaps be confident about his skills, doesn't lift much. The guys who do ESD actually don't look to lift the thing. They only want to lift the periphery to make the cut. So it's, there's now no finite amount. Uh, one other question is that, uh, uh, that uh, how do you look at a polyp and how do you decide in a later spreading tumor that the deeper invasion and your decision of resecting it or leaving it through for surgeons to resect it? So okay. one look at it because you do CT scan, CT scan may not be uh, give you an answer. So at colonoscopy, uh, how you take that such a decision? Is a good question. I didn't go into the characterization of polyps or uh, thing because if you have one, a non-granular lateral spreading tumor, that means it's not that bumpy, velvety kind of thing, but it's more kind of smooth. Then, you know, you say very high chance that this patient has got uh, high grade dysplasia or maybe thing. Second is look at the surface. If there are very bumpy areas in a, in a granular ST, lot, dominant nodules, Again, a high risk. Look at the vascular patterns. If there are amorphous areas or very irregular vessels, then you say there may be uh, sub deep submucosal invasion. Very big lesions, very, you know, sort of very bulky uh, lesions, four centimeters, five centimeters, not flat, more bulky, more uh, deep submucosal invasion. So if you go through all that in a systematic way, then you can say, predict that, yes, I think this is safe enough for me to go through. Uh, but I feel this may be high-grade dysplasia because of some vascular changes, but they are sort of doubtful. I'll go for an ESD. I'll take the chance. If I get a complete clearance, good. Otherwise, it would be a staging ESD. I'll send the patient for surgery if the report comes, you know, not in his favor. So Absolutely. put everything together and then take a decision. Uh, maybe the Kusa will invite you once more to talk you more about uh, polypractization uh, because we didn't discuss about... Uh, uh, the optical endoscopy. We talked only principles of uh, polypectomy today. So, so other question uh, the gopis want to know that there's a large polyp and you remove a polyp, but the, the, there's a small ped pedicle still left. Is that a concern? No. If you see, you said that, uh, you, said that uh, you come closer to the polyp and leave a pedicle intact. No, if you've got a stalk like this and the polyp is there, see, you can make out the surface of the polyp has a totally different texture and also the vessels, the patterns, surface patterns are very different. So if you, go, you know, look at the, say, the kudos pattern or something, you can make out that the stalk resembles that of the mucosa of the colon, normal mucosa, and the polyp component, the adomatous component is different. So if you have cut here and the stalk remains perfectly fine, this is what you have to achieve. You have to only remove the adenomatous tissue with a reasonable margin. But of course, the pathologist may tell you that you have removed, but there is already that there's some invasion to the stock, in which case he goes for surgery. Uh, does non-lifting sign uh, suggest uh, in deep invasion? Yeah, it's not always that there is means deep invasion. A non-lifting sign can occur because of many features. One may be just wrong technique. You don't... Uh, technique, you put your injection and it goes into the muscle. It doesn't lift well. Two, there's a lot of submucosal fibrosis. It doesn't lift well. Or of course, as you rightly said, there may be deep submucosal invasion and so it may not lift well. So when you have that, a very experienced endoscopist would then look at the surface and say, it doesn't look sinister to me. It's not lifting. It doesn't look sinister. I'll go and do an ESD. 
But if you are not having that capability of doing an ESD, if you can't lift, you can't do an EMR. So you might as well leave it. So if someone can do an ESD, fine. If But you can't do an EMR if it doesn't lift. Because with an ESD, you can manage the submucosal fibrosis. Right. Uh, there's one other question. Uh, your experience on using monofilament uh, a cold snare polypectomy. Yes, we've uh, we've uh, adapted to cold snare poly polypectomy in a big way. Uh, in fact, we do a lot of uh, polypectomies in our unit, and uh, I, I think it's, it takes about say ten or fifteen uh, sort of uh, procedures to get comfortable. But as I said, the most important thing is you must have a dedicated snare a monofilament snare, which is a little stiff, right? And then you must know the technique. You must get it at six o'clock. That lesion should be at six. Get your snare, put it there, dip it. Push your sheath towards the thing, include a bit of the margin, and then ask your technician to tighten it. Yes. As he slowly tighten it, you also suck the lumen so that the whole thing gets grabbed because it's quite flat. Then it gets grabbed. Once you've got it, just hold for a few seconds and then ask him to close. So it's not difficult. It's just once you understand the process, watch a few videos. Uh, I, I think it's eminently doable and you can follow this in your regular practice. Suppose uh, uh, somebody don't have a, a core snare, polypectomy snare. And so is it a limitation of the particular center? Maybe or is it you can manage by routine uh, kind of... Uh, procedure? No, since cold snare polypectomy is going to be there, is there to stay and is going to be a major part of your technique, is I think you must invest in a cold snare. It's not very expensive. Sure. It's not expensive. So I think you should because the regular uh, snares uh, usually tend to slip. They don't grasp that polyp so well. And so you'll get frustrated because you can't do the polypectomy. It invariably slips. And so then what do you do? You go inject raise it and then hold it like a regular, uh, you know, uh, horse snare uh, EMR kind of technique and then do it. So I don't think that's a I think master the technique, get the, you know, appropriate uh, device and do it. I think it's a wonderful talking and I don't feel like stopping. Uh, this is, a, but we have a, only this much time. So this is 7.30. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bhatt for a wonderful, I would say remarkable, uh, uh, lecture on principles of polypectomy, talking about when to do, how to do, and uh, what precautions you take. And one point I want to again highlight uh, that uh, don't biopsy a polyp, better you remove it. With this, uh, thank you, Dr. Bhatt and Dr. Deepa Gunjan for two wonderful lectures. I think uh, we had a, a wonderful learning today. And, and uh, more importantly, we had a good discussion in both the topics. With this. Thank you, thank you Govind. I hand over to Dr. Jimil Sa for conclusion. Thank you, Dr. Naresh Bhatt sir and uh, Dr. Deepak Gunjan for uh, such uh, informative and excellent lectures and uh, sparing your time for this academic activity from your clinical activities and clinical commitments. Uh, and uh, thank you, Dr. Gavin Makharia sir for um, conduct, chair, uh, chairing this session and uh, leading the discussion in such a nice way. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to request uh, all the postgraduate to uh, log in from their personal MacBook or uh, computer or from the phone to join the quiz. Uh, the quiz will be based on the today's topic that is endoscopy and polypectomy. Uh, you will be given 45 seconds to answer each question. Like to, to, yes, sir. Before yes, sir. you go to your quiz question, there's yes, one sir. question that are these videos available somewhere? Someone want to refer to these videos because they yes, are sir. wonderful videos and many will like to revisit these videos. Yes, sir. We will uh, make these videos available on our official website soon. Uh, we have not yet made it available, but we will uh, make it available in some time. Perfect.